Thank you very much, John Peter. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I will give you a, an overview of uh, how civil society is giving an input in the European Union uh, level. I'm not the chair, but I'm a member of the Civil Society Forum on Drugs. Uh, this is uh, actually the major uh, forum or mechanisms to mechanism to involve civil society into decision making in the European Union level. I've been participating in the forum since its beginnings in 2006, and uh, this is now has become an expert group of the European Commission. Uh, it ha we have uh, uh, more than 40 members uh, selected by the Commission for three years and uh, we have uh, uh, five people in the core group uh, and uh, we have uh, alter, uh, annual meetings, uh, annual plen plenary meetings uh, and we also have uh, joint meetings with the uh, uh, meeting of the governments. You know, the European Union member state representatives meet every month in Brussels and th this meeting is called the Horizontal Working Party on Drugs. And uh, now we established the connection between the two, for, uh, two uh, fora and uh, we have uh, regular meetings with them, uh, although this relationship was sometimes uh, quite uh, difficult. Uh, and uh, the Civil Society Forum on Drugs has uh, four working groups. Uh, so the first working group is uh, on international relations, uh, mostly giving an input on the UN debate, for example, chaired by IDPC. Uh, and uh, the second group is uh, on the European Union's action plan and the drug strategy. Uh, and this was chaired by uh, me for several years. And uh, uh, we have the third working group on civil society involvement in the national level in the European Union. And then the fourth working group is working on implementing uh, quality standards for harm reduction and demand reduction uh, services in the European Union. And you should know, you, you see this, uh, uh, this, is, this was the last plenary meeting of the forum in Brussels. And this is a really diverse group. So diverse in terms of uh, geographical uh, uh, distribution, but also in terms of world views and approaches. So we also have, you know, recovery organizations and not only harm reduction organizations and uh, the CSFD uh, was involved in uh, preparing the current uh, uh, EU action plan on drugs uh, so the European Union has a drug, a drug strategy which is for the year 2013-2020 and it had two uh, it has two action plans the, the previous one expired in 2016 and uh, in 2017 uh, uh, the EU Council adopted the new uh, action plan and also made a midterm uh, evaluation of the previous uh, drug strategy and the, in this process in this whole process uh, civil society forum on drugs was uh, uh, involved completely and i think that's in itself a, a, a big achievement now that uh, civil society participates in uh, creating the most important documents in the european union level and I'm happy to report to you that uh, our recommendations uh, uh, were uh, adopted and accepted by the Commission in many uh, cases. So we, uh, this, this EU action plan on drugs is actually the most progressive one uh, has ever adopted uh, also in terms of uh, harm reduction. Uh, this is the first action plan, for example, uh, 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 you know, mentioning and in favor of uh, innovative harm reduction services such as drug consumption rooms, uh, drug checking services uh, and uh, uh, naloxone distribution also it uh, is specifying different you know vulnerable groups uh, women prisoners migrants uh, it, it also has uh, an action on uh, uh, measuring the human rights impacts of drug policies uh, it is uh, promoting uh, civil society involvement in the national level into the uh, national level policy making uh, implementing quality standards uh, uh, of harm reduction and demand reduction and also promotes alternatives to coercive sanctions as you know in the EU there is no consensus on decriminalization but there is a consensus on promoting alternatives to coercive uh, sanctions uh, so it's a very very strong and progressive uh, action plan on drugs but there are uh, serious shortcomings with this document so for example it's not legally binding so you you know many times people ask me like so can you force our government to implement the eu drug strategy and that's not the case 
uh, because uh, it's not a legally binding document. It's more like you know recommendations or uh, more like a, a policy document uh, um, for for member states. And uh, there are also problems uh, with the drug coordination in the European uh, uh, institutions. So the drug unit, which is coordinates drug policy in the European Union, uh, is at the home department of the Commission and uh, uh, not in the health department. And sometimes, you know, there is a kind of lack of uh, proper communication between the health and the uh, home. I think you have, in many of your countries, you have the same uh, uh, lack, lack of coherence in terms of drug policy coordination. Uh, and uh, uh, the European Commission has a very low budget on, on drug policy. Uh, so m maybe many of you applied for this EC Just uh, grants. You know, it's the uh, every year the EU uh, has this grant, but it's like two million and sometimes hundreds of uh, NGOs are applying for that uh, very small um, amount of money. And um, the, it's, it's, it's again a, another problem that although there is a, an evaluation of the EU action plan on drugs and drug strategies, it's not an impact evaluation, it's usually an outcome evaluation. So for example, you know, with police, uh, like, uh, how, my, how, my, how much drugs the police uh, seized, but it doesn't uh, uh, take account like what is the real impact of that seizure on the drug market. Um, uh, the Civil Society Forum on Drugs Prepared uh, produced uh, a survey to give an input on to the, to the implementation and the evaluation of the current EU action plan on drugs. So we were uh, we, we produced uh, an online questionnaire and we distributed it among uh, NGOs and we were we would like to uh, we, we wanted to you know map uh, the perceptions of NGOs on access to and quality of uh, uh, different services, uh, 12 major services including the main harm reduction services, uh, opiate substitution treatment, uh, NSP, drug consumption room, naloxone, drug checking. Uh, in a 10 point scale and also not only in among the vulnerable uh, not, not only among the general population but also in specific groups such as uh, prisoners women uh, young and aging uh, people migrants ethnic uh, minorities uh, so this report is about which was now published on the website of the civil society forum on drugs you can uh, download that report uh, this is uh, uh, about the perceptions of those uh, NGOs uh, civil society organizations who work on the field, so as you see, most of the respondents uh, were working or providing harm reduction services. So this is not to, you know, replace EMCDDA report, but it's more supplementing what EMCDDA reports uh, uh, have. And uh, uh, actually, there is a plan to make this uh, regular report now uh, on behalf of the Civil Society Forum on Drugs. Uh, we got uh, uh, 169 uh, responses from 32 European uh, uh, countries including all member states except Malta. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, not from, a, from not every country, we got a high uh, number of uh, responses. So for example, like Denmark, Greece or Croatia, uh, the, we had less responses and uh, that's, so the, 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 the results were, or findings were not so strong. But from many countries, we, we received uh, several responses from several NGOs and uh, in those countries, responses are stronger. And this, is, uh, the, this graph shows uh, uh, the mean access and, uh, to and quality of service, different services in the European Union perceived by uh, those who are providing these services and advocating for them. And as, as you can see, uh, uh, the, the, those uh, harm reduction services, the, the innovative harm reduction services such as OST, naloxone, drug checking, drug consumption room, uh, the access to those services is really minimal, very low uh, in it, in most uh, most of the countries. Uh, this is for this this graph shows uh, perceived access to needle and syringe uh, programs, and as uh, you can see in most European countries, this is a really perceived as, as one of the most uh, available or accessible services, but in the eastern part of the EU, uh, the access to this service is really extremely low, uh, and there, there is a country where actually there is zero access to a uh, uh, needle exchange program, uh, Bulgaria. Uh, and uh, this is uh, showing the uh, perceived uh, access to opiate substitution uh, programs. 
this is uh, access to uh, naloxone distribution, which is uh, actually completely missing from most, uh, uh, most uh, uh, member states. And the same situation is with uh, drug checking uh, services. Uh, in, in many countries, the, there are NGOs, you know, or, or community organizations distributing some kind of rapid tests, you know, in parties and festivals. But that's that, that's not real drug checking with the proper technical uh, uh, equipment. Uh, and um, and uh, the perceived access to drug consumption rooms is the lowest among all uh, services and. Uh, that doesn't, need, that doesn't mean that actually we don't need drug consumption rooms because even in the East where there is absolutely no access, there is a huge, huge need uh, for, for drug consumption rooms. Uh, we also asked about uh, how, uh, how, how professionals rate uh, you know, the accessibility of uh, services among specific uh, groups. And as you can see, for example, harm reduction services are Mm, uh, uh, access to harm reduction services is really low in among the prisoners and uh, migrants, ethnic uh, mi minorities in the EU. So those are those groups where, uh, you know, there are the most significant gaps. Uh, and uh, we can see um, a very serious divide, uh, a regional divide in the European Union, and we have been talking a lot about it in this conference, that in the uh, eastern part of the EU and also uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, candidate countries of the EU, uh, there is extremely low access to some harm reduction services. Uh, and uh, I think we can talk about the crisis. And sometimes I felt at this conference that this is not really emphasized enough, that we, are, we have really having a, an emergency situation in many countries, a crisis where, uh, uh, where harm reduction services which were established in the uh, 2000s co completely collapsed. And this is partly because of a change in funding environment, uh, also partly ch ch change in political uh, environments and uh, let's say the problematic countries are uh, uh, those reflected or highlighted uh, on the map, for example, Lithuania, Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, uh, um, uh, Serbia and uh, Romania and Bulgaria. And uh, for example, here where we are in Romania, we know that uh, uh, clients served by needle exchange programs in, in just this year dropped from 7,500 to 2,000 people. Uh, in Bulgaria, needle and syringe programs completely stopped. There is no, not, no needle exchange anymore because of lack of funding. Uh, in Hungary, we still have on paper many uh, needle and syringe programs and some of them really operate. But uh, the two largest programs were shut down actually, who, which uh, served uh, more than half of needles distributed in the whole country. Okay, and, um, and I think uh, it's also important to uh, to, to show that uh, there is also something common in these countries, and that's that this, these harm reduction programs are serving the same population. Uh, people, uh, marginalized people living in poverty, and uh, sometimes, uh, or if you ask, uh, for example, harm reduction service providers in Slovakia, Romania, Hungary, Serbia, like how many of your clients are Roma people, they will say that nine out of ten. And I think this issue is not really, not, not uh, emphasized enough, again, because uh, I think uh, this is, uh, uh, what we have uh, he here is uh, a population living in deep poverty and excluded completely from uh, society, and uh, they are using drugs in such uh, environments. For example, this one is from Sofia, or this, uh, we, we made a movie, uh, and my organization made a movie in Belgrade about harm reduction program which actually closed down uh, a few years ago, and uh, this was one of the houses where drug users live in the outskirts of uh, Belgrade. And this picture shows uh, one drug scene in my own, my own city, Budapest. So uh, we don't really, I, th I think in, in these cities we don't really have a drug problem, but we have a poverty problem, we have a, uh, a, a social exclusion problem, a racism problem, and a segregation problem. Uh, and I think we don't really address that enough. Uh, so uh, we need to do that. Uh, so some conclusions, um, uh, we have a very strong action plan but a very weak uh, implementation. 
there is not enough funding and not enough political will to implement the action plan on drugs, uh, or even uh, you know governments made a com commitment uh, to to implement it. But in many countries, there are really serious uh, shortcomings. Uh, and, and it's uh, my experience as a member of the Civil Society Forum, it's really, really hard to address these issues uh, in the European level, in the European fora. For example, uh, at the HDG level, we very rarely have a meaningful discussion about drug policies. It's kind of same, similar to the UN, where we have a gentleman club and uh, nobody is naming and shaming countries for uh, uh, their shortcomings. Uh, then, as I already mentioned, that we have outcome evaluations, no impact evaluations, and for example, with new psychoactive substances, you know, uh, we make a lot of efforts to ban new substances, but does anybody take the effort to uh, actually evaluate the impact of those, uh, uh, you know, measures when you know new substances are taken under uh, brought under control? So, what will what effect it will have on the market? And nobody is investigating that. It's just you know ticking the box: a new substances banned. And uh, then another problem, especially in the eastern part, we have structural funds, development funds in these countries, in the new member states, but they are very rarely can be used for harm reduction programs. Uh, and uh, in case when we have, for example, Lithuania now made available structural funds for harm reduction, but at the same time they cut the budget for, from the central budget. Uh, for harm reduction programs, so it doesn't, didn't really help. Uh, then, um, uh, for example, in the European Union and the European Commission made a lot of effort to create, uh, uh, you know, the early warning system and emergency legislation to uh, bring new substances under control. But we don't have a similar system or mechanism to intervene uh, in cross-border public health crises. So, for example, when we have outbreaks of HIV and hepatitis. Uh, we don't have any funds, emergency funds, to support uh, people working on the ground. And I think that's a really, you know, one-sided approach, uh, even if the European Union is always proud to have a balanced approach, but in terms of money, efforts, uh, our approach is not balanced at all. Uh, then uh, another problem that uh, uh, innovative harm reduction services, actually innovation ends with the Eastern uh, border of the EU, so there is no innovation at all in, in our countries like Hungary or Bulgaria. Uh, then, as I told, there, is, there are huge regional gaps and, and these interrup interruptions of services in the East are, should be addressed in the European level because these are not problems of individual countries. We see cross-border patterns here. And uh, I think uh, the EU, after you know, the big, big, uh, fund, big donors such as Global Fund leaving the region, I think the EU must step in and uh, take responsibility for their own countries and give support for harm reduction programs. Uh, and then finally, that uh, uh, the services uh, among vulnerable people are much less accessible than among the uh, general population. And uh, my, that's my view that uh, drug policies are still used in many countries to discipline the poor people and uh, to, you know, to segregate them from society and to punish them for, for being minorities, actually. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Bravo, bravo. Th thank you very much for your excellent presentation in, in which you somehow combined the two main themes of this, uh, of this session. One is on, on uh, uh, drug policy and, and, and civil society consultation, and on the other hand, it's uh, the, this, the state of affairs of harm reduction in, uh, in Europe. And it's good that you mentioned uh, the, uh, the word crisis, uh, because that, that, that picture with, uh, with the map clearly shows that uh, uh, there is a serious rollback in, uh, in harm reduction in um, a significant part of uh, Europe. Um, do we have any questions or comments for Peter? Is it? Okay. Yeah, uh, I'm here. Okay, I, I will bring to, to Milutin. Uh, 
Uh, my, my, actually, my question, uh, I, I know the situation, and thank you for, for making it very clear and, and visible, but my question to you, do you believe that uh, a EU action plan could be used uh, for advocacy for funding? Because, because we, we discussed it several times, and I, I don't know what, what you feel. Because it, it is uh, the only point we could stay, yes, EU supports uh, harm reduction, and thanks to, to your advocacy and civil society for on drugs, we could say it in the chapter 24 even for accession. But do you believe that we could use the action plan as a background for, for advocacy for funding for harm reduction? Well, I think that it, uh, one problem is that there is very little aver awareness in the member states about the existence of uh, EU level, you know, strategy documents. So uh, I, I think that we don't use them enough. And now we should use more. And that's why I, I present, I made this presentation to point out that we have this very strong and progressive document. And I think this can be an advocacy tool, but it depends on us NGOs how we can use it. Uh, as I mentioned, it's not legally binding documents, but uh, clearly governments made a commitment uh, to scale up these services. And what we can see is that, for example, in the eastern part of the EU, no countries scaled up harm reduction services except maybe Latvia. So uh, and yeah, Croatia, but uh, but no other no other no other member states. So I I, I think that we should use it uh, more. Uh, thank you. A final uh, question or comment from Milutin. Milutin from Drug Policy Network Southeast Europe. It doesn't seem very important, but I think it is in a way. Why are members of the civil society forum appointed by the European Commission? Uh, that's the usual procedure with all expert groups of the Commission. So the C CSFD is an expert group of the EU Commission, and uh, there is an open call, so all NGOs can apply. And then it's, it's the Commission who is selecting them based on application. So there is like a detailed application, and based on their competence, experience in the field, and uh, experience in international affairs. It's not a perfect system, I, I think, but... Um, but, um, yeah, I don't know how you could improve that. Yeah, I mean, that's the problem which we face very often on national level, where the governmental people are appointing uh, NGO representatives, and they can be either from Gongos uh, and all these things, and very often they find it as an excuse. I know that it's not in this case, but if we are a civil society, we should fight for our own position and our own internal mechanisms to appoint people there and not to give the credit, uh, to, to give this opportunity to governmental people. Just, it doesn't seem logical to me. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, okay. Okay. Just to mention that, for example, in Hungary, we had a system where NGOs elected their representatives themselves to the governmental body, not with this current government, but previous one. So, uh, we, we could do that, but I think it's EU rules, you know, here, bureaucratic rules. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, we've got a couple of minutes left, and I um, w would like to ask the, the panelists, uh, if you look at the situation in Europe regarding harm reduction in terms of drug policy, if we, if you look at the, 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 the global situation, um, it's obvious that we're living in, in challenging uh, times. On the one hand, there are, uh, there are more and more countries accepting harm reduction. Um, in, in paper, they have, some, so they have services. Uh, uh, on the other hand, there's, uh, the, the funding is a serious problem in, in uh, many parts of the world, um, and nowadays also in uh, the big parts of uh, Europe. That's w one side. Uh, and on the other, uh, there's the big drug policy debate, which comes to another, let's say, there's an, another big event next year in, in March. What would you, as, as, as experts, what would you uh, give the audience as a, a kind of a take-home message? What can uh, the people in the, in, the, in the room do? We're setting homework. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would say if there was one thing, it would be as a harm reduction community as we are to we've got to keep speaking up speaking up about bad things because there's plenty of those speaking up about the good things because there's also plenty of those but keep speaking up we have to keep having our voice heard at every level of this debate national regional international 
And obviously that includes the task force, please apply to speak, please come to Vienna, please be part of that debate because that debate is happening anyway, whether you're there or not. But at least if you're there, you can, you can try to steer it and try to influence it. So that would be my one piece of homework. Speak up. Okay. Sam, what would you like to... Um, in the hope that it's not too self-promoting, although it is, I would say read the global state of harm reduction, because there's no way that we as, as advocates or activists or as a movement can know where it is we want to go if we don't know where we are at the moment. We have to have a good idea of what the situation is around us and what civil society, if, if we're coming from a perspective of civil society, we need to know what it is that civil society says the actual situation is on the ground, where there are gaps between policy and practice. So I would set some reading. Excellent, thank you very much. Ingo, no, with all your experience, what would you t ask and t or tell the, the audience to do when they come home on Friday or start working on Monday? Well, <clears throat> concerning my experience in Germany, it, uh, as I already mentioned, there is a strong NGO movement and Deutsche Aidsup is still, how to say, leading uh, organization and uh, getting money from the government, but using this money really for trainings, for advocacy work. For, for example, there's a big, uh, had been a big challenge concerning OST treatment in Germany. And they had, uh, this, there's now a big improvement uh, in the law, and the NGOs have been very supportive. Um, and they are not fighting against, for example, the doc medical doctors who are providing OST, but try to cooperate and uh, help them to change maybe uh, some attitudes. On the other hand, of course, I would like that these NGOs should be more involved in this international sphere because. I always try to uh, inform uh, about these meetings in Vienna, and there's a wonderful papers from IDPC, but anyway, it's very difficult to get, in Germany, uh, even NGOs to be involved. Uh, it's a lack of language, whatever, and sometimes I'm not interested what is going on in Vienna. And of course, it's also my experience. Uh, I told you, they're, they're discussing 24 hours of on resolutions, and are proud, well, we have this paper, and nobody interested in, in this paper. But anyway, I'm, I'm, it is good uh, you, uh, you mentioned this new strategy, uh, EU and, uh, action plan. Of course, we can use this, and the NGOs should use these, also the international standards to, to, to strengthen the, the, the capacity and to, to, um, yeah, and, and to improve the situation of a drug-using population. I think it can help. For example, the German uh, service organization, the uh, NGOs are having, organizing uh, in, in, in 21st of July each day, year a National uh, Remembrance Day on, on drug-related deaths. And they're using it also in, in now in 50 cities in Germany, all over Germany, also to, to discuss drug policy and, and, and to, do, to have a loud voice on this. And I think th these kinds of activities are very helpful. Um, of course, there are gaps, but we are improving. Although, I, as, for example, my, my boss is from the Conservative Party, a former boss, and she went to Lisboa. And she was, now she came back and said, oh, Portugal's Portugal uh, model is well, quite good. Maybe we can do it in Germany as well. I was surprised, but uh, did you do it to convince her? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and the final word of, uh, of, of, of homework. So we, we've heard uh, speak up, read, be engaged. What would you ask the, uh, the audience to do? Yeah, my experience is uh, that uh, we, it's important to understand uh, that decisions are not made in Vienna and Brussels about drug policies, but they are very important indicators of change. And uh, I think when we are advocating for like this outcome documented the ANGES or EU action plan on drugs, uh, we should not mistaken them uh, to the final goal of our advocacy. These are only tools, very, very important tools. But if you don't use them in the national level, in the local level, 
then uh, it's just you know half of the job to have progressive documents such as the action plan on drugs. Or we, hopefully in 2019 we have, we will have something more even more progressive at the UN level. Whatever we will not we, we will see. But to have these documents is just half of the job, and then we need to use them in the in the national level in advocacy. And in this this uh, regard, I would say that uh, homework could be to leave our comfort zones and uh, try to mainstream this debate, and not only you know preach to the converted, and uh, not only you know uh, speak always to the same people who are already uh, who are already converted to the cause of harm reduction, but try maybe to broaden your alliances with with like other fields and. Uh, we have many social justice movements, and what I feel sometimes is that we are fighting in an isolated way. Uh, everybody has its own, you know, narrow, uh, un, uh, uh, narrow uh, focus, and uh, we miss many opportunities to cooperate and uh, and also to to see the bigger picture in, in, in advocacy, which is also about you know, transparency, transparency, accountability of decision making and, uh, and democracy itself and civil society. So uh, that would be my advice. Thank you very much. Um, I, I would like to finalize uh, uh, this session. Uh, I, th I thought it was a, a brilliant session, uh, very inspiring, um, with some homework for all of us. Um, to read, to be engaged, to to, um, to speak up, and uh, speak up to uh, different audiences, and uh, continue doing this work. Um, having that said, I would like to have a final round of applause for the uh, for the panel, and I w w wish you a very fruitful uh, conference, and uh, hope to see you tomorrow and in the evening at the party. See you at the dance floor. Thank you.